After 30 years of being called just Sam, my stepdaughter apologized at Christmas for never accepting me as her dad, and called me dad for the first time. I, 63M, lost my wife, Beth, 60F at the time, three years ago. We had been together for 30 years. When I met my wife, she was already a widow. Her first husband had died in a car accident. She had a daughter, Jane 43F, who was six at the time her father passed. We married when Jane was about 10 years old. When I came into Jane's life, I had no idea how to be a parent to her. I expressed my fears to Beth, and she told me to let her take the lead. I talked with Jane and told her that I knew I could never replace her dad and was not trying to. However, I would be willing to do all the dad stuff that her dad wasn't around to do if she wanted. I drove her to practices, attended every performance, stayed up late to help her study for math tests, and taught her to drive and shoot. I shared my love of fantasy literature and Star Trek. Our relationship was always hot and cold, though. While she seemed happy, I was never dad, stepdad, or even Uncle Sam. I was always just Sam. Beth and I had a son, Tom, 32M, and a daughter, Christy, 29F. Jane has a reasonable relationship with her half-siblings, considering their age difference. A year or so after Christy was born, Jane became sullen and despondent. After talking with Beth, I offered to adopt Jane. Jane did not take this well, and I never brought it up again. I was the main disciplinarian parent in our household and while none of the kids were troublemakers, they all did things that got them grounded or their privileges with our cars taken away. I think Jane resented this as well. When Jane graduated high school, each student was able to purchase two tickets to the ceremony. Jane purchased two tickets, and I thought I would be attending, but the week of the ceremony, Beth told me that Jane wanted to use her second seat to memorialize her father. I was hurt, but I understood. She put a picture of him on the empty chair next to her mom. I think it also hurt Beth as well. Jane was an excellent student, and she got some good scholarships. I paid the remainder of her costs to go to college, I did get to see that graduation. When Jane got married, Beth and I were not able to pay for the entirety of her wedding, we paid about half. She had her father's younger brother walk her down the aisle, she would spend a week or two during the summer with her father's family. At the reception, my wife was again seated next to an empty chair to memorialize Jane's father. I was not given a seat with Beth at the family table, and honestly, I don't remember where I was supposed to be because I spent my time at the bar or standing behind Beth, who was having a very hard time. However, it was a lovely wedding, and once the dancing started and everybody was out of their seats, I stopped worrying about where I was supposed to be. When Jane had her first kid, Beth and I were overjoyed. However, I soon learned that while my wife was going to be Graham Graham, I was not going to be Grandpa but still just Sam. I am Sam to both of her children. This was again something that hurt, and when Tom had his first child, he asked if I wanted to be Granddad or Sam to his kids, and I jumped at getting to be Grandpa. Jane ended up getting divorced about four years ago, shortly before Beth was diagnosed with cancer. She and her kids moved in with us, and we helped her with her lawyer until everything was finalized. During my wife's last year, Jane was with us all the time. It was a huge help to both Beth and me. After Beth passed, I was a wreck and mostly useless. It wasn't right, but Jane ended up doing most of the funeral preparation. I am very grateful for the help she provided. When Jane's father died, his mother helped with the funeral expenses and purchased a double plot. When Jane prepared the funeral, she organized everything so that Beth would be buried next to Jane's father, her first husband. I was shocked and felt that this was done somewhat behind my back. My wife had never told me of this, but Jane assured me that this was what Beth would have wanted. I talked with Tom and Christy, and they know I intend to be cremated. Because of that, they thought that this was reasonable, and the plot was already paid for. At the memorial service, Jane was rightfully upset. She told many of the other mourners that she was now orphaned and that she and her two kids had no close family left. This upset Tom and Christy a lot, but I tried to explain that it was different for Jane. I talked with Jane during the memorial and told her that she does have a family that will welcome her if she wants it. She thanked me and was polite. I have not really talked with Jane since the memorial. The first year, I invited Jane to all the family get-togethers just like before, even though Tom and Christy were angry with her. I left her voicemails asking how she was doing and how her kids were. However, in the last couple of years, I have stopped because I never get any response. I still send her and her kids gifts for their birthdays and Christmas. I just don't actively reach out. In one of the last voicemails I left, I told her that all she needed to do was call, and I would help her. With all that information, here is where I might be the ah. My daughter Christy is getting married next year. She reached out to Jane in the past few months and has been working on reconciling with her. Additionally, Jane's ex lives in a different state, and her kids will be gone for most of the holidays. Jane has told Christy about how alone she is feeling. Christy called me and asked me to invite Jane to my house for Christmas. Christy and her fiancé will be there along with Tom and his family. I told Christy that Jane knows she is always invited. Christy says that Jane won't come if I don't call and ask her to come. I told Christy that she could invite Jane, or she could tell Jane to call me. Christy says I'm being an ah for not calling Jane. 
I talked with my son Tom, and he says he is tired of the rest of us having to beg Jane to be part of our family. I love Jane, she is my daughter, but after so much, I just feel like the only way this will work is if she takes the first steps. So, am I the offer not calling my wife's daughter to invite her to Christmas? Jane, if you see this, just call. Edit, I am really astounded by all the comments. I thought I would just get a few, but there are too many to answer them all. I do feel the need to clear some things up, though. I tried to be the best parent I could be to Jane, with Beth's help. I never wanted her to feel like our family was not also her family or that her family had been replaced. I never felt like an ATM machine. I paid less than half of Jane's schooling because of her scholarships. I did what I could for her wedding, and yes, I was pissed about the seating and who got to walk her down the aisle, but Beth reminded me it was her day, not mine. I will be paying for a larger share of Christie's wedding than I did Jane's because my financial situation is different now, but Christie has asked for something I think her mom would have fought with her over already, but that is a story for another post. I don't think I did anything that would make Jane resent me, besides marrying her mom. However, Jane has, except for a few occasions, always been polite and friendly to me. Maybe I shouldn't have put the wedding stuff in the post at all, but she did have a not father-daughter dance with me at her wedding. When Beth passed, Jane told me that her mother was amazingly lucky to have found true love twice in one lifetime. When I offered to adopt Jane, it went very badly. Beth and I had sat her down and made the offer. We thought that after the birth of Christy, she was feeling left out. It backfired horribly. Jane said she didn't want my stupid fucking name. I tried to explain that she wouldn't need to change her name, but she started screaming at me that she didn't want my stupid fucking name, family or anything else. Both Beth and I told her that this response was completely unacceptable, but she kept saying nasty things that teenagers say to me and Beth. I told her that her behavior was totally unacceptable and since her mom had lots of class and manners, this behavior must come from her stupid fucking father's family. Beth told me that I wasn't helping, and I left while she talked with Jane. A couple of days later, Jane asked to talk with Beth and me privately. She said she wanted to move in with her uncle. I figured this was a hollow threat from a teenager since that uncle lived two states over, and her life and friends were all where we lived. I said something like, well, if that's how you feel, you and your mom work it out, I will make it happen. I then left. Jane didn't move out, I did tell her that I was glad she chose to stay with us. Our relationship did get better but never substantially improved after that point. So, I am not a saint, I am human, and I did my best. Am I mad she doesn't consider Tom, Christy, and me as her family? Yes. However, I have known her since she was 8 years old. I, at least, don't know how not to love a child I have helped raise since they played with dolls. I see her as family. Update, so, Christmas has come and gone, for those interested, here is an update. Most people said it was time for Jane to face the consequences of her actions. Did Jane deserve to spend Christmas alone? Perhaps, but I didn't want my girl to be alone or sad when I could do something about it. So, I called and once again got sent to voicemail. I left a message saying that I didn't know what her plans were but that she should know that she is always welcome at our house. I figured that would be it, and I could tell Christy that I tried. On Saturday, I got a call from Jane. She seemed very down. She told me the same things I had heard from Christy. Her kids would be out of state with her ex for Christmas and New Year. She was feeling very alone. I told her that she is always welcome to celebrate with her brother and sister and myself. She said that sounded really good and she would like that. So, Jane, Christy, and her fiancé, John, spent Christmas Eve with me. It was really nice. Jane was very sweet to everyone. My first post may not have been fair to her, but Jane can be an incredibly caring person. She seemed a little on edge at first, but as the evening went on, she became more at ease. We watched a Muppet Christmas Charl just like when my kids were younger. After my phone call with Jane, I found Tom, Christy, and Jane's old stockings. There was not a lot of time, but I got some candy, a book and a couple of gift cards for Jane, Christy, and John. On Christmas morning, all three were a bit surprised to find that they had stockings filled with goodies and called me a jerk for not telling them beforehand so that they could make sure I had one, two. I said I was not involved and you can't call Santa a jerk or you get nothing just like me. Tom and his family came over on Christmas Day. Jane practically knows more about what is going on with Tom's kids than I do because she is very active on Facebook. Jane's gifts to everyone, well, everyone save John, were very thoughtful. Jane is great with kids, she is a teacher, and Tom's kids really enjoy their aunt. Jane and Christy made our Christmas dinner, and seeing giggling like schoolgirls in the kitchen together reminded me of Christmas long ago when Christy was 7 or 8. Jane was home from college, and Jane, Beth and Christy were all working in the kitchen. Christy was standing on a chair, and Jane was teaching her all our secret family recipes. Christy adored Jane in the way that little kids adore adults who are not their parents. Jane was just so patient and kind to her little sister. I remember Beth, Jane and Christy telling Tom and me that stinky boys need to set the table. Seeing Jane and Christy together got me thinking about Beth, and I had to find a quiet spot to compose myself. 
Tom found me in my office. He said that Jane had told him that I had called her. He said that he was glad I did. That he was not sure he would have been willing or able to make the call. I told him I bet if it were his kid, he would have. That's probably enough of my family Christmas. I know that the real update is, did I talk with Jane? Tom and his family went home because his kids wanted to play with their new toys. Christy and John left to meet John's family for a late Christmas meal and get together. As Christy was leaving, she gave me a hug and told me, Merry Christmas, Daddy. When I turned around and saw Jane, I could see dread on her face. After everyone had left, Jane asked to talk with me. We had a long conversation, and I'm going to hit the important parts. Jane said she was very thankful to be invited for Christmas. She told me that when she started dating after her divorce, because of her age, she met a lot of guys who had older kids like her own. Many didn't think trying to blend families with older kids was a good idea. I guess they figured the kids would be out of the house soon, and they had co-parenting relationships that worked for them. However, Jane has her kids pretty much all the time. A large factor in her divorce had been that her husband had a view that his job was more important than their kids' lives. She wanted to be with somebody who would show her kids, especially her son, that family is not just a thing women care about. Apparently, as her longest relationship was spiraling, she had an argument with her boyfriend where she said something like, and remember, I am paraphrasing a story she told me, what's so hard about stepping up and being a good dad, my stepdad was able to do it, and he didn't have any kids of his own when he married my mom. To which that boyfriend said something like, you mean the guy you treat like sexy, and your kids treat him badly, too? She says that after that fight or whatever, she kind of started thinking about our relationship, the things I had done for her, and that she had done as well. She told me she felt embarrassed and ashamed. She didn't even know how to start to fix anything, and she thought Tom, Christy, and I were mad at her. She asked me if we could have a relationship like I have with Christy and Tom. I told her that I could not give her a replica of my relationship with Christy and that none of us could change the past. I told her that for me, nothing had changed from when I was at the park that afternoon, where I told her that I would be willing to do all the things her dad was not around to do. I will always be as much her dad as she wants. Jane was crying by this point, and I held her. She started sobbing harder and saying she was sorry. I told her that I knew and that everything was okay. In the middle of this, something happened that I had waited a very long time to hear. The sobs of I'm sorry became dad, I'm so sorry. I am so so sorry. Well, one apology and a good cry don't change a person. The next morning, I was mostly back to being Sam, but there were a few dads and even one daddy sprinkled in. We will see. Some other things I'm guessing people will want to know. We did talk about her mom's funeral. She said that she didn't mean to do anything secretive. By using the plot that was paid for, they saved on some costs and were able to get an encasement as well. The encasement should make it possible to have my cremains interred with my wife. Also, I guess a down payment has been made towards a headstone for me that can be integrated with my wife's. Finally, her youngest was apparently upset that Tom's oldest called me grandpa all the time at the funeral and thought that it meant I liked Tom's son more than him. That was years ago now, but she said she would be bringing up the Grandpa Sam situation with her kids. I said I would like that. In all of this, Jane never tried to say that it was her father's brother or any of the rest of her father's family who didn't like me or made her act like she did. There was no evil outside influence. She is just a scared girl who wishes she could have done some things differently. I know many people said that she wouldn't really change. I know change is very hard. Maybe after the holidays, everything will just go back to being like it was. However, even if that's what happens, I at least got one Christmas day when Jane wanted me to be her dad. Also, Jane knows I am posting this and said it was okay. Now on to the next story. Story 2. Came home early and caught my wife cheating red-handed, she tried to deny it at first, but the truth came out. My wife and I met through our parents 8 years ago and we got married shortly after. We joked around and told people it was an arranged marriage because that was what it felt like. They thought we would be cute together and practically forced us on our first date. I had been too focused on my career to really focus on a serious relationship before I met her. I had a lot of meaningless flings and casual partners, but I hadn't met anyone I wanted to settle down with. When we got together, it finally clicked for me. I could see what people meant when they talked about love at first sight and just knowing when you meet the right person. We had our first child together after being married for two years. Everything was falling into place with us and it felt amazing. We owned our own home, had two kids, and a dog, and were in love. My job has always been very demanding. I have to travel a lot, when I'm not traveling I'm working late nights at the office, and I have to take work home with me quite often. That was why casual flings worked so well for me before meeting my wife. If I was in the mood, I could just call someone and I didn't have to worry about much else. It was more difficult to balance when I was married. I would spend long days at work and come home to my wife and the kids and still have to be on with them. By the end of the day, I was exhausted. I'll admit, my sex life with my wife lacked a lot of spontaneity. When we had sex with each other, it was practically scheduled. She would tell me she wanted to, and I would tell her a day that worked for me. In hindsight, I know that it was probably unfulfilling, 
but it was never brought up to me. I made good money and I took care of my wife. She didn't work, so she stayed home and took care of the kids. When they were both in school, she didn't have as much to do during the day. She would tell me about how bored she would get after the house was cleaned and how she needed to find something to fill her time. She invested in a lot of different hobbies to try during the day but nothing stuck. She decided to join a cooking class at the local community center. She had always been a great cook, so I didn't understand why she was taking a class for it. When I asked her about it, she said it was to expand our taste buds. She was learning all kinds of new techniques and recipes and she was really proud of her work. I was happy that she was happy and I didn't question it anymore. She cooked some of the new recipes for us for dinner and while we ate she would rave about the things she learned. She would always talk about the class instructor and how brilliant he was. He was apparently very innovative and planning on opening a new restaurant in town. I had no idea anything was going on until I saw it with my own eyes. I had been at work one day when I got sick. I had been feeling bad in the morning, but I forced myself to go to work. In the middle of the day, I couldn't take it anymore and decided to go home. I was so out of it that a co-worker drove me home, I didn't even think to text my wife and let her know I was on my way home. When I walked in, I could see that she had the dining room set up for a meal. It looked romantic. There were candles and wine glasses laid out. She was dressed up and in the kitchen cooking. I walked in and asked what was going on. She was very surprised to see me and tried to make it seem like she was just experimenting. I still didn't understand why there were two places set at the table. The doorbell rang not long after I arrived and I answered it. A young man was on the other side and he turned as pale as a ghost when he saw that I answered. He had a bottle of wine with him, so I assumed he was the dinner guest. My wife introduced me to him and told me that he was her cooking instructor. She tried to play it off as inviting him over to show him what he taught her. Honestly, I didn't believe it. But I was awfully sick. I was having a hard time standing upright and I needed to collapse in bed. It was something that I needed to handle another time. It seemed fishy, but it wasn't impossible that she was telling me the truth. I went to my room and passed out in the bed. I woke up early the following morning and my wife was next to me. Part of me thought it was a dream but I knew that it wasn't. While she was asleep, I grabbed her phone and looked through it. There were obviously a lot of deleted messages between her and the instructor, which was a major red flag. She was hiding something and I knew that their lunch wasn't as innocent as she tried to make it seem. I looked through her image gallery and found a few hidden photos of the instructor. They were shirtless pictures mostly, but I found one picture of another man's private parts and assumed it was his. I sent what I was able to find to myself and put her phone back before she woke up. She had never given me any reason to suspect that she was cheating on me, but at that moment I started to wonder if I just missed the signs because I was too busy working. I called out of work but I told my wife I was going in. I ended up stopping by the library to use a computer and look for a good divorce attorney. After I found one, I did some digging into the cooking instructor my wife had been seeing. I found his website online and saw that he was a minor cooking influencer online. He had a lot of followers on his social media pages and even had some sponsorships. I figured that I could ruin all of that for him. I found out who managed the community center and contacted them, informing them of the inappropriate behavior of the instructor. He seemed to be relying on the kitchen at the community center while he planned his restaurant opening. I had no doubt he was relying on that income to get it started too. When I was done there, I lingered around town until I could go home and pretend like I worked all day. I waited until I had some information from my lawyer to tell my wife that it was over. When I finally got the word, I served her with the papers and savored the shocked expression. I told her I knew about the instructor and she tried to deny it. When she realized there was no point, she started explaining why it happened. She told me that she was feeling unfulfilled. She put all of the blame on me for not satisfying her and making her feel like she came second to my job. Like I said before, in hindsight, I can agree with that. But she never came to me and told me anything. If she had, I would have listened to her and tried to change for her. I would have gone to counseling if we needed to. I loved her Andy would have done anything to make sure our relationship was okay. But, she decided what she wanted to do and sealed our fate for us. There was no going back to the way things were for me. She was disappointed and tried to sway me away from divorce, but it wasn't going to happen. We ended up divorcing and I was favored in the end because she cheated. We still have to spend a lot of time together due to custody arrangements and we're cordial, but I don't talk to her about anything other than the kids.